So would you mind introducing yourself for the audience, please? Perfect. My name is Andrew Tischler. I'm a painter. I love art. Um, I, I can't remember what I said in the last one. Uh, what do I like? What do I do? I, I, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm a professional artist and I'm a teacher. And um, that's me basically in a nutshell. I'm obsessed with realism painting and oils. Um, I just love it. Um, ever since I was a young boy, I just wanted to work out how to do that, how to paint like the old masters. And so now I just spend my time painting, but also making videos of what I paint and I try to teach others how to paint as well and how to improve their artwork. And so I've been doing this professionally now for the last 20 years. I've been teaching uh, for the last 10 years and I've been online um, when I started my YouTube channel back in 2016, I've been online since then, um, basically sharing what I do with uh, my YouTube videos and all that good stuff. So um, it's been a fun journey so far. That's my, that's my story in a nutshell. I go into way more uh, detail in part one. Check out part one. <laughs> Fantastic. No, that's perfect. And I, I mean, in part one, we discussed a lot of your um, kind of business side of, of what you do. So I'm looking forward to delving a little bit more into the painting. But first, I'd like to ask you about the teaching, because you mentioned that both times, and we really haven't asked you about that. Um, for the benefit of the mm. audience, Richard is sadly not joining us today, but he will be here for future episodes. But sadly, he mm. couldn't make it for this episode. Um so yeah, as far as teaching goes, you teach online. Do you also teach in person or is it exclusively an online course? Well, I, actually, I used to teach in person. That's where I where I got started. I, I don't do that nowadays, but I'm entertaining the idea of doing some art tours again uh, with my good buddy Samuel Earp here in New Zealand, where we'll take people uh, plain air painting. So I, I'm we're really keen on this idea and uh, don't, don't don't hold me to it just yet. So we're we're just working out some details and working out logistically when the best time would, would be to do that. But yeah, I, I got my start uh, teaching uh, in person and it actually started off quite by accident. I, um, I gave a talk uh, to an art society. Um, it was called the Alfred Cove Art Society in Perth in Western Australia. And this is many, many years ago now. And I shook like a leaf through that entire presentation. Um, but afterwards, there were a lot of people that came up to me that, you know, said very kind things. A lot of people were saying things like they understood a concept now that they didn't quite have a grasp of before. And I, I started to think, you know, maybe I could do this and maybe I could really help people with their art. Um, I became addicted to it. Um, then in a very small kind of scenario, uh, for a small setting, you know, it had very humble beginnings. Um, I would drop flyers off at art retail shops. And there was one chain in Perth at the time. I'm sure it's still going. It was called Jackson's Drawing Supplies. And I actually used to work there. Um, but I, I went back to the branch I used to work at, as well as others. And I just said, hey, look, can we put this up in the window of the shop and see if other people want to come to my workshop? And so basically, I held a workshop that was 10 students um, for each Saturday, and the workshop went over a course of four Saturdays in a row, and where I'd take them through things like composition, color theory, and then we'd work on a painting. It would be something that was self-directed for them, and then I'd go around and help students with their work based on some of the concepts that I was sharing with them in the first two weeks. And that turned out to be very popular. I sold out one workshop after another after another. At the time though, when I'd started that, I had to go into teaching because I needed something to supplement my income, which was becoming more and more sporadic because the market was doing all sorts of really weird things. I had you know, come off the back of a really fantastic career where I was selling out exhibitions. I was getting fantastic commissions from wealthy clients all over Western Australia. And the bottom just fell out of that. And I needed to work out a way, you know, shoot, how am I gonna feed myself? I just met this, beautiful woman that I, I, I knew I was going to marry and things were just <laughs> going to the dogs. It was not working out um, professionally speaking. And so I, uh, I really needed to work out a way to, to make it work, to support us. And so um, teaching workshops was just something that, that happened. And it was kind of off the back of that demonstration to the art society. But one thing that happened in that classroom was I just worked out. I, I loved this so much. It was so exhilarating and fulfilling. And I just felt connected to people. And I, I just worked out, my goodness, I, I, I love this. And I wanted to keep doing that. 
but then going online, it was a completely different world for me. Um, I, I worked out, you know, sure, I can, I can teach a class of 10 people or I can make a video that gets seen by 10,000 people. And that's, that's now where I put my focus and energy. You know, it's, it, it might seem a little bit impersonal, but for me, it's not. For me, it's still very much personal. I still get messages and emails from people still to this day um, where my videos have affected them in a positive way. And that, that just means the world to me and it keeps me going. So it, I, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. No, it's fantastic. I mean, it made me think a lot about how early on when I started learning about different uh, media um, for art making, I would try to engage with uh, different teachers. And I found that I learned in a specific way when I would be getting instruction from the teacher of add a bit more of this, then try this, then do this. I really struggled. It, it felt like uh, chaotic signals in my mind whereas when they told me about the theory this specifically happened with watercolor for me and this um, professional painter who i know she told me about the theory of watercolor and how it works and why you apply it the way you do and then she showed me her painting something quickly in her garden and it just clicked and from that point on i thought i, I know i can use watercolor now it's a comfortable medium for me because of the theory and then seeing the practice, even though I wasn't doing it myself, I could see how she was doing it as opposed to her saying, add more water, add more of this color, add more of that color. And it was just trying to follow the steps was more difficult than seeing them being done after hearing the theory to back up the, the principles mm -hmm. of how it works and how to make an impact with that medium mm -hmm. for the greatest result. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think very few of us learn from just hearing theory alone. We must do, we must apply. And this is something, you know, especially true in art. I mean, you can have a lecturer up the front of, of the room or, or in the class, you know, talking and just waffling on about stuff. But unless you're actually seeing it either demonstrated and then you've got a chance to execute on that yourself, you're not really pushing your learning as far as you could. Now, that said, you know, what, what, what I try to do is share as much of that technique and demonstration as possible and then break it into some sort of step-by-step -step process that somebody else could follow. And not just necessarily, you know, to paint what I'm painting, but to take that as, as theory, as concepts being demonstrated so that now it's like, ah, I can see what he's talking about. I can see how that's applied. I saw him do it. I know exactly what I'm going to do for that painting I'm struggling with, or I know exactly now how to paint water in any type of scenario. So I, I think it's really important. The doing part is is absolutely essential. And I think it's I think it's wonderful. Like when we find instructors and teachers that that help something go click for us, then that's um that's amazing too. I, I I've all I've learned so much by just from guests I've had on my podcast. Um, I've learned a ton from just hearing them talk about some things, but also from seeing examples of what they've put online. Um, when you have those two things coupled together, it's pretty powerful. It's made a huge impact on me as well. Yeah. Well, I've, I'm going to ask you a couple of things about um, mm -hmm. topics that you have discussed on your Instagram, but I think this would be a good opportunity for our audience to hear you talk about it more in, at length, which is um, things like uh, when you are painting, you do, you do a lot of plein air painting. And um, I believe in that a lot. So I've practiced that several times this year as much as possible anyway why is it that you think it's important to do plein air painting for you well i i think i think anytime the artist has an opportunity to work from direct observation it's going to inform all kinds of things across a broad range of work so it's not just uh, doing a plein air as a study for that specific location to then take that specific location back into the studio what happens as you're working from life, whether it's a charcoal drawing from a plaster casting or painting a little riverbank, plein air, what you're doing is you're studying nature, you're studying light, you're studying form, shape, texture, and you're building this library within your mind of what nature does, how it works. And you can start to draw upon these experiences and these things back in the studio. I'll give you an example. When people rely too heavily on photographic reference, for instance, 
and they're out in the field and they, they photograph this particularly dramatic, epic landscape. Normally what happens when they get those photographs back into the studio is there's all kinds of aberrations, errors that are present in the photographic image. Normally this is in the form of halftone dropout or you know your, your shadows turn black or your, your lights are overexposed. One or the other normally, you know, sometimes with very skilled photographers that understand aperture, shutter speed, ISO and all that sort of stuff, they could probably do a pretty good job with that. But for us painters, you know, and I, I'll speak for myself, I, I'm just a point and click kind of guy if I'm shooting reference. The trouble is, is that when you take just the reference back to the studio, you might be inclined to paint exactly what you're seeing in that image, which is darker shadows or blowing out highlights. You don't get this full range. You don't, you don't understand what value does or color does over depth. And so consequently, it kind of, it holds you back from what you could truly achieve had you really studied that landscape from life. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be that landscape or that exact view per se. It could just be something similar, or it could just be an observation you made when you were in the field. So now what ends up happening is you can look at your photograph and you can go, okay, those shadows are completely black. They've dropped out due to that halftone dropout, or my highlights are totally gone because they're totally burned out. But I know because I was standing on the banks of that river in, in a midday, very sharp, uh, bright light. I, I know when I was standing on those banks that those banks weren't actually black. There was a lot of color reverberating out. And in fact, I made notes in this plain air study that they shifted violet. And then over here in the light, there was a slight golden hue there. So I'm gonna incorporate that in my painting and see how that turns out. What happens is you start to learn these lessons and you can draw upon these lessons. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's experience. And by, by working from direct observation, you build this wealth of experience that really accelerates your learning. Now, you know, the truth is I, I didn't start painting plein air. I, I started doing a bunch of work from photography, but I've always been an observer. I've always been looking at things and, and I've always been a questioner as well. Like I was I questioned everything about, you know, the visual reality around me. Like, why is that doing that? Why does that look that way? Why do the edges appear lost there? How come I can't discern what's going on in the shadow there? Why is this shape appearing? How do you get that highlight? So I, you start to build it up almost mentally in a way. But it, when, I, when I started painting plain air and really taking that practice seriously, I saw a dramatic improvement in my studio work and my work across the board. And I'm still, I'm still learning to this day. I'm still accelerating my own growth artistically. And, and I have plein air to thank for that. And also working from direct observation. So one of the things I, I've done recently with my academy students is we went through an entire Fundamentals of Oil Painting program um, that I designed based on working from direct observation in the studio, doing some very simple still life paintings where we would paint an egg and then we would get a little bit more complicated. And we did this, this exercise called three vessels where students had to take three different vessels, you know, a mug, an egg cup, a film canister or something. It could be anything in random. I had three different ceramic vessels of, of different sorts and then orientated them in different ways, shone a light on them and then just worked from direct observation on that. Just that exercise alone will tell you so much that you just can't get it back out of a photograph. So I, I, I think it's absolutely essential um, for myself, uh, you know, just speaking personally. And that's why I encourage all of my students to do it as well, because I just say, look, you know, don't take my word for it. Just give it a shot. And you tell me if this makes a, an improvement in your work. And for the most part, everybody's come back going far out. I didn't know it looked like that until I tried to paint that. You know, there's this thing in painting. I, I'm sure you've heard it, Simon, which is, you know, paint what you see, not what you know. And this is a huge problem with the beginner is that they're painting what they know. You know. What does this mean? Like we know, for instance, let, let's go back to a landscape analogy. We know, for instance, if we're looking at mountains that are covered in forest, that mountains at a great distance are covered in the same green trees that we can see in the immediate foreground. But if we were to paint it with the same saturation of green that we knew those trees are, then we'd completely blow out our, our saturation, our, our hues over depth, and we wouldn't get that depth effect that we actually, what, what happens when we see. Because when I see, I can see that the yellow in that green has dropped away, giving way rise to these blues and violets that are showing up at extreme depth. And now what happens is we can get that depth back into our landscape by painting just what we see, not what we know. So I know the tree is green, 
but I can see it's actually violet at an extreme depth. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love things yeah. like this. I discussed this with a, a chap called Paul Easton, who's an urban sketcher and he does things in black and white predominantly, but it's still um, how to educate yourself through observation and to ensure that you don't uh, assume things and you question what sometimes you will uh, feel you know over what you see. And some things that he told me, which I thought was re were really interesting, was uh, he said, if you're foreshortening something, make it half the, uh, the width that your brain is telling you to make it, because your brain will lie to you and your hand and eye will tell you the truth. Your brain will tell you to enlarge things. And he said that usually if you're doing a shadow side of a building, your brain will want to lighten that. So it's usually almost twice as dark as what your mind will want to do. Things like that I, I found to be quite true myself. And uh, mm. and it's a very interesting observation. I mean, I told him about how uh, similar to yourself, how, you know, mountains have a blue tint in the, you know, in the distance. And he, he knows this obviously as well. And also uh, the lightest part of a clear blue sky is lower and not higher in the sky, which I think is a really right. interesting uh, yeah. truth. Closest to the people. horizon now. Yeah 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 so it's things like that i think are very um important for people to observe themselves but even if to just share these things will make people look something which the uh, same lady who taught me uh watercolor showed me was that when you're doing a seascape the horizon of the sea is tonally equivalent with the sky and it's a very blurry line i mean unless in specific conditions i assume but especially where we are it's it's a, a hue difference as opposed to a tonal difference because the the mm. join between the sky and the sea is very subtle indeed and you need mm. to almost make that incredibly soft and no sharp edge mm. on the horizon line um is there anything like that that you can think of that is um i mean obviously we want to encourage people to observe for themselves but things like that can really encourage people to look closer anyway uh because Absolutely. of the uh, observations Is there anything else that you can mm. that spring to mind as observations you've gleaned from from your experiences yeah i i guess i guess it kind of relates so i i got a comment just today actually um on my instagram from somebody that was complaining that their paintings looked too cartoonish and i was thinking about this um because i i think it also goes back to what we were talking about there with painting what you see not what you know and i think what tends to happen particularly when we first start our painting journey is we tend to paint in symbols so when somebody says their paintings look cartoonish it to me that indicates that they've got areas of flat color with clear defined edges it's what a cartoon is you know if you were to draw a cartoon face there'd be a clear outline of that face and then you'd color bart simpson in yellow just flat yellow no no variation in that whatsoever um and so I think I think one of the things that w when you're working from that direct observation again just to go back to go back to that you realize that there's nothing really that's flat color you'll notice that even a flat white wall that's been painted with a roller and is absolutely perfect because the plaster has been in there and it's sanded that down it's perfectly smooth watch when you've got the curtains open the dance of white across that wall it is not a flat white wall there's stuff going on so it's it's learning to see in this way and to think in terms of color in terms of value i i, I call value tone so when people hear me say tone they're like, what are you talking about I mean, yeah it's it's value and you start to think in terms of this hierarchy of value as well so one thing that i think really will help if there's one thing that would really help people improve across the board, I think it's it's almost adopting this painting mindset. So we carry that idea of direct observation into the studio, but it's something that we need to work on every single day. I'll see if I can get this out in such a way that it makes sense. But I, I've, I've thought about this for years and I I got my students to start doing this, the, the students on my academy, because I, I started talking about this in live streams and, and various video lessons. Whenever you're observing anything, immediately ask the question, how could I paint that? Now, it doesn't matter if you're like, you're looking at the, the blue metal bottle on your desk. Ask that question, how could I paint that? You know, and you start thinking about the world, you know, the, the, the teacup, the, the fluorescent green uh, pen, 
Oh, on the desk. Shout out Corinne Wittenbach, who bought me this really cool pen. Still my favorite. Still my favorite. But I look at that and I go, how can I paint that? How can I mix that color? And what would I have to do to get an indication of the change in angle and form? I find my mind wondering, and I'm thinking about this, everything that I look at now, it's, it's a bit mad, really. You will go a little bit mad doing this. But start asking yourself, how could I paint that? How could I paint that? What color would I mix to achieve that? What brush would I have to use to get the fineness of that highlight? How could I communicate that texture? What, what brush would I go for next? Would I go for a fan? Would I go for a trimmed dagger brush? Would I go for something that was maybe a sable or a bristle? What would I, how could I do that? How could I paint that? What do I mix? And you start coming up with combinations and textures and applications it really starts, things will start to click into place by just starting to ask the question, how, how, how could I do that? How could I re recreate that with paint? It, what it does is it, it, it shifts your thinking away, again, away from that, what do I know about this? I know the bottle's blue, okay? I know this is a flat metallic blue bottle, but when I really look at it, I can see the paint's knocked off it and where it is that stainless steel is showing through and I'm seeing reflections of what's going on in the room. So this little reflection is, is warmer, this one's brighter. You start seeing nuance, you start seeing little subtleties here that make it special. And when you want to paint realism, and, and I find a lot of the people that, that follow my work, they want to know how do I get something to look real? That's what it is. It's learning to tune your mind into the subtleties of the reality that's around you. If you can just learn to see the immense variety and, and the specialness of random innocuous objects around you, and you can ask the question, how can I recreate that visually? It suddenly opens up this world in front of you. And then you suddenly realize that there's no end to it. There's no, there's no way I can see in my mind that it's possible for me to go, I finally understand how to do this. Because the, the visual world is, is, is infinite. You know, it's, it, there, there's no way that you could exhaust the, that world of subject matter. And so there's no way you could exhaust the amount of study that you'll have to do and the amount of thinking that you could dedicate to such a pursuit. So to, again, I, I, I keep asking, does that make sense? Because <laughs> I, 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 as I'm talking about it, I'm thinking, you know, it, it does sound a little mental. It does, but um, I, I, I hope that's clear. Um, but uh, if you want me to elaborate more on it, please, uh, I'm happy to. Well, I mean, I, I have a lot of, uh, uh, I can relate to a lot of what you've said because of my experience with uh, someone who I consider an art mentor, even though she's not so keen on me calling her that, but she's definitely mentored me because of how, uh, on walks with her she'd say how would you paint that and it's very much what you're talking about you know just getting you to see the world in paint and uh, where's the light coming from and what's the lightest part and what color would you paint this in just allows Excellent. your brain to adjust into that uh, mindset where you're analyzing things in um, in color in in a bit more of an interesting way and in approach to painting now she's uh she does quite uh, well rendered landscapes herself as well not to the extent that you have and she has been in awe of your work when I've shared it with her and I wanted to ask you as well that there is uh, an interesting very uh, bright pink that you use when you're from what I understand redesigning something once a painting has commenced and you've started rendering it can you talk a little bit about your you know the pink that you use to redesign things and why you do that and, and how Oh, so when when the pink comes out, it means that uh, I, I I probably could have spent a bit more time in design. Uh, that's what I use as a way to make changes in the composition. So obvious to me that that I, I know the next moves that I'm going to have to make. Um, it's it's a way of just really making something visually striking and coming up with a game plan to just go ahead and, and attack it. It could be teal, it could be you know yellow or, or whatever, but I happen to go for this bright pink, which is a combination of magenta and titanium white, um, or or it could be lead white, but it's it's very thin. Um, so normally you know titanium does work well for this, but it's it's very thin. It's not a thick 
brush stroke because I don't want it to come through in subsequent layers. But I, but I do have a painting here that you'll see kind of just to the side. And I, I released a YouTube video, my latest YouTube video, by the time this is being recorded, um, was one, uh, a, it was a large seascape inspired by this area called the Chetwodes. And I was so excited after the first iteration of that composition. I was so excited. You know, I came back from this trip. I gathered my references. I wasn't able to paint plain air, unfortunately, because two things. One, I tried painting plain air from the boat. It was so rocky that I was starting to get a little bit ill. And two, it's a Department of Conservation wilderness zone, and you're not allowed to land on the island at all. Um, and man, I would love to land on that island and, and paint that. But still, the law is the law, and I didn't fancy a big fat fine, so I, I figured I, I better not do that. Um, so I, I got back to the studio. I gave the composition my best shot. I went through a series of thumbnails. I went through a series, uh, a, a digital drawing that took over a week to do this digital drawing. And then I went ahead and, and projected my digital design up to the canvas. Um, we could talk a little bit about projection as well, because I realized just by saying that I've opened up a tin of worms. So let's come back to that. But um, after I did that, I, I started to work. I created the block in and it, everything was going well. So I thought, but I, I had painted into my scene a whole bunch of things that I didn't see at the time. I was so fixed on particular elements in my composition that the whole theme of the video is kill your darlings, which is a writer's uh, expression where you'll get fixated on, on details, plot points, characters that don't serve the overall greater purpose of the narrative work. And they get in the way, they're stumbling blocks, but you're attached to them because they took so much time to craft. Meanwhile, while you're busy crafting these details in your storyline, you don't realize that they're completely the story's moved on and they don't actually serve that story at all. So you, you've got to cut them out. And so that, that, uh, that expression, kill your darlings, um, was, was, I, I think it was coined by, by Faulkner. Um, I could be wrong, but that if memory serves, that's the name of the, the author that, that, uh, the writer that, um, coined that expression, kill your darlings, but it holds true for painting because we get fixated on these, these details. And for me in that painting, it was this rock, this really sharp, shark fin rock and what i didn't explain in the video very well is how i shifted the mountain behind that rock so facing the camera here it's, it's kind of moved towards the the right a little bit and as that happened as i killed that darling of the rock changed its shape completely changed the composition um the painting ended up taking on another form but you you're specifically asking about that pink line and so that period between okay i've got my block in here it's not working. Something's got to change. And the new composition, I had to go back to the drawing board, spend another eight, nine days. And I'm talking full days. I'm talking all day. Like I, I told my wife, we, we had her parents staying here at the time. I said, y'all aren't going to see me for a week. I'm going to come down for dinner, but that's it. I got to stay for this. I got to get this thing worked out. And I, I'm glad I took that time. But then I projected it once again, there's a tin of worms. I'm, I'm cracking out two tens of worms now we got to deal with here. Uh, but I, I project it once again. And, and I, and, and to get that line, I started using that, that bright magenta so that when I turned the projector off, the studio lights came back on. It's like, bam, I can see it. I know exactly what I got to do. Bam, go and kill it. And so, um, I'm much happier with the composition now as a result of doing that work. It's still not a hundred percent, but I, I'm I'm gonna see this one through. Um, I'm I'm 95% sure I'm gonna see this one through with with how it is here. It's a challenging painting. Not gonna lie, it's it's got a lot going on, and there's a lot of visual things in here that are gonna be very challenging. So I'm looking forward to doing that video and the whole thing and sharing that with my students. That's fascinating. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Well, it'd be remiss of me not to address the couple of tins of worms in the room. So. Yeah. Let's discuss projection if you can. What do you mean by projection? Yeah. Can you expand on what you meant? Yeah, no, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, okay, okay, here we go. This thing has come up in art time and time again. And I, I, I have had very strong opinions um, in the past. I'm easing up and softening on them. Not for myself per se, but uh, for, for my students as well, because I, I think I don't want anybody to feel ashamed. If you are, 
because people can get very opinionated about this and then they can start bashing people in comment section and then you get these clicks and, and people can get very elitist about this. If projection right now is your current MO and you're, you're projecting some photographs and you're just starting out, you're a beginner, then that's okay. Don't feel ashamed for that. My, my hope is that you get the brush in your head and you just start painting. Whatever that is that you're doing, just paint. And that's phenomenal. But often what happens with, with people that are starting out or even a lot of professionals, even people that are somewhere halfway along their art journey, they, um, they have this voice in the back of their head. It's almost like, ah, I haven't done this properly. You know, somebody's going to find out I've done this. They start beating themselves up over what they did. I, I just want to tell you right now, it's okay. However you came to, to get this image, it's okay. With the exception of copying somebody else's work and pretending that that's your own. That's, that's where I have an issue. But if you're not harming anybody and you're not lying, then it's all right. However you do it is how you do it. Okay, that said, one thing I will not allow myself to do is trace photographs. I won't project a photograph and, and trace that off. Now, if anybody listening is doing that again, okay, we've already established that's okay if you're just learning. But I didn't learn that way, and I'm going to just encourage you, finish up this painting. If you're doing that now on the current painting, finish up this one. All right, give yourself a pat on the back. That was great. From here on out, work from direct observation, draw, sketch, plan. It's going to make you a much better artist. Yeah, it's going to suck in the beginning. You're going to struggle through this, but that struggle is where the growth is. So when it comes to projection, why do artists today and some professionals use projection? And there are all kinds of different professional artists out there. And there, there are some professional artists that are projecting photographs and tracing them and then claiming that they drew them. I'm not one of those people, but I do know of professionals that do that and have done that and, and they're big names and, and you might recognize some of them. But it, it's, I, I think what is important for me is to draw everything out by hand. And so that question might come up. It's like, well, if you're going to sit on the computer and draw something, what, what does that mean? How does that look? So I, I draw using a Wacom tablet. I draw in Photoshop and I'm drawing layer by layer. When you look at the base layer, you'll no, notice that in my designs, when, when I show my videos, it's the underlying preparatory drawing, like the sketch, which is my latest compositional study or the color study. That will be my base layer and I'll just start painting over the top. At no time do I take photography and drag it into Photoshop and start bashing around on that. Even though people do that, that's their art form, that's fine. Now, now that, that process is, is something that some designers will use, visual effects artists, uh, digital matte painters, and that's okay, that's, that's something different. You know, just for me, the, the satisfaction comes in recreating every single thing by hand. And so what's happening is, is you've got this process where imagery has really been derived from direct observation in the field, be it plein air, photography, sketches, that sort of thing. It's then filtered through the brain and it goes through to the hand and now you're executing with that hand. Whether it's digital, in the sketchbook, on the canvas, it's all very much um, this, the same type of process for me. Once I have that digital drawing then, that digital design, that's meticulously designed and some of it's based on mathematical proportions as well in proportion to my canvas, then I'll project that to make sure I get it absolutely accurate. And then you might go, well, you know, how do you know? You, you could get it distorted slightly. Most projectors now have got a keystone feature where you could make the sides kind of bow in or out to fit exactly what it is you're projecting to, and you don't get any distortion whatsoever using that feature. So even though the, the projector could be slightly below perpendicular to your canvas, that's all right. You could still expand that projection with that keystone feature, and, and you, can, you can get a perfectly flat image on the canvas. And so from there, I just, um, I, I just sketch it up and I get to work. There was a um, there was a talented young artist, and I, I want to make sure I get his name right, because his post he got some he got some flack, man, and his post just blew up. Um, here he is. Uh, I, I want to shout out Macon Bentley, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Macon. But it's um, at underscore M A C O N Art. And he did this uh, painting, which was his original digital design of two Black Panthers, um, if memory serves. And then he, with, with most of the people were very nice to him. 
but they just started destroying this poor guy. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. They started destroying him in the comment section. I was like, hang on a second. I jumped in there, a whole bunch of other people jumped in there, but that one reel that he produced blew up for him. So I think it did really well for him. Um, but if he's a phenomenal painter, he's a great artist, but he was taking his original design and he was applying this exact process that I've just explained to you. So it went through that observation, through, through working, studying, drawing it out by hand, and then getting his design up there. What is the difference between doing that and using a grid system? You've got to get it up there somehow. And often when artists are doing these large scale works, and that was particularly large painting in that example, but the, the seascape painting that I'm working on, it's a massive painting. So if you're going to do anything that big and you want to get exactly what it is on your canvas, then uh, as from the design to the canvas, then it does make sense to have some sort of trick like, like projecting. So that, that's why I use it. I, I stand by it. I don't think it makes me any less of an artist. If anyone wants to challenge me on that, then fine. That's okay. Works for me. <laughs> so, um, and I also think that there's an enormous body of evidence out there that artists from the past used projection. But, you know, I, I'm talking about hacks like Caravaggio, right? Um, or, and there is evidence to suggest that Vermeer might have used a, a camera lucida. I, I'm kidding, I love Caravaggio, he's not a hack. But if you look at what a camera obscura is, and David Hockney did some fascinating work on this, um, but uh, with, with visual effects and how they've been used in, in art making in the past, um, you know, the, artists have come up with visual tricks to project onto canvases. But here's the kicker. They could also draw. They could draw rings around anybody. They knew what they were doing and they, they could get it done. So they're looking for a way that they can get it done quick and accurately. Um, I use it as a process of getting what I've drawn by hand up on that canvas. I rest my case. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I've, I've tried everything as far as early on I did. I used a projector and not to say I used it early on and now I don't because I improved. I just mean... I tried it for certain pieces and then I tried a grid system. I started to learn the horizontal and vertical markers to try and improve my eye. There is a level of a purist uh, approach, which some people try to embody. But I will say, if you don't disclose how you made a painting and you show it, no one's going to pat you on the back for doing it using the purist method. If you show that you've drawn it by hand and then you painted it no one in the comment section will congratulate you for that so it only seems to uh well I, I only see it in the negative i don't see it in the positive where people are credited aside from someone like kim jong Yi, i don't know if you're familiar with him he oh, yeah. passed away Absolutely. last year and he was credited yeah. with being an ink first uh draftsman but aside from him you don't really see people being you know given praise for their process that you see more criticism uh than than praise which is a strange um uh, kind of uh hypocrisy to an extent where people won't equally meet out um good comments mm -hmm. you know positive comments to people who do uh draw and i very much like the the idea which jeff watts has uh shared about you want your eye to be trained um, so not using a grid can give advantage with learning your mistakes and being critical, but that's not, it's not a right way of doing it as opposed to a wrong way. It's just an approach. As you've said, every approach will lead to a final product. And that's all you really want to achieve is finishing a piece and not, a uh, you know, kind of wrestling around with what the correct way of achieving that is aside from and something which you mentioned which i know the answer to this but for the benefit of the audience i say i know i have a i've looked at your account enough to know what you've said about this so i want to ask as though i don't one thing that you did mention in that is about not not copying someone else's work the exception to that which i would like to ask you about is how you feel about a master's study or a master's copy and uh, the benefit yeah, yeah. Of that. Well, I know, and I, I do want to say, like, you can you can copy people's work. Absolutely. Uh, I want to give people free reign to copy my work. Go for it. But the, 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 the thing is, the caveat there is don't pass it off as your own. Um, and I've had a lot of people copy my work and then try and sell it as their own work. And, and that always 
that always bites them in the end and and it will it will always come back doesn't matter who you are um and but what 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 a master copy can do this is when you're up front about what it is you're doing if it's a homage you know a tribute or or a, or a copy just an outright copy when you're saying look i've done this after such and such an artist the, those those master copies can teach you so much. Just this weekend, I was flipping to, through some of my favorite art books, and I was flipping through Moran's book. I, I was specifically looking for old black and white photographs of great artists in in their studio spaces. Thomas Moran's studio, um, phenomenal big empty space. He was working with natural light. These two huge windows, and he has this fireplace in the corner. And above the fireplace, he's got his copy of Turner's painting. I forget the title of Turner's painting, but you could just make it out in this black and white photograph. And it's it was extraordinary to see that here he was doing master copies of Turner and Claude Lorraine and, and some of the other greats for him in his time. I mean, Turner's still a great. But then I was looking at uh, John Singer Sargent and John Singer Sargent was doing um, master copies of Franz Hall's and um, Velasquez was another one that he did a copy of. And uh, so you can see that artists have always done this. They've seen things that they, that artists that they admire and they wanna learn something. They wanna, they wanna learn a particular technique or an effect, or there was maybe just an appreciation for how the master handled form and light. And you, you unlock a few of these things as you go ever, over every square inch of that painting, studying it, by trying to mimic what you saw there. And again, as artists, we learn by doing. And you know, you can look at something, you can think about something, but it's not until you really do it that you start unlocking those lessons for you. And 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 you're like, oh, this is this is how they did that. This is what they're talking about. And so I I, I did a couple of these um master copies. I, I did one of Arthur Wardle's Silent Watchers, and I did another one um, called In the Orchard, which is a copy of, of um, a horse painting by Lucy Kemp Welch. And I wanted to do these master copies specifically of paintings that I had seen in the flesh that had an impact on me and, and that I just loved. One of them, you know, truth be told, was um, one of my wife's favorite paintings. So the Lucy Kemp Welch horse painting in the orchard was hanging at the Christchurch uh, Museum here in the South Island of New Zealand. And Silent Watchers is hanging at the um, Jackson Hole Museum for Wildlife Art, um, which I saw back in 09. That painting of those two lines, man, have floored me. Of all the artwork there, and there's some phenomenal work there. There's like an epic Robert Bateman. There's uh, amazing sculptures by by Mattia, and, and there's and 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 uh, and bun and there's just incredible work at that museum. But it was it was this one painting that just floored me, and I kept coming back to it. I went there with my dad, and and he just was like, well, "What's your deal with this painting, man? You know, there's there's all this cool art. You know, you keep coming back to this thing. I'm like, there's just something about it. It had a narrative quality. It was so painterly and loose." yet it was so sensitively done with those lions. It wasn't that it was photographic, but it was so real. Um, it, you know, being a nocturne, it had that cold alien feeling of the light in this big empty desert expanse, this beautiful little crackling fire on the horizon. It was amazing, it was absolutely amazing. So I, I wanted to repaint these things and really understand how they were created. And so what started to happen through that process was I, I was mixing up color. And so I was getting the colors okay. I'm, I'm pretty good with my colors and matching and that sort of thing. And and I, I had found some great images online for the Arthur Wardle painting. I wasn't able to take photographs at the time, if memory serves. I, I don't, don't think you were allowed photography there, but I didn't even have a smartphone back in, in, in 09. So, you know, it's not like today. You just pull your iPhone out and click, 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 and you do a pretty good job with that. But I found some good stuff online. But what I did find, again, hanging in the Christchurch Art Gallery, I'll have to email you some of these pictures, Simon, so you can cut it into the conversation. But I found, I found Arthur Wardle's study for Silent Watchers, which has only a single lioness in there. It's quite big for a study. It's about 30 by 40 or thereabouts. But I could see his technique up close. So you bet I got that iPhone out and started clicking this thing. And so I was looking at his study 
and I was looking at the images that I found online. So I was able to go, I could see exactly what his colors are doing. And, and I got that kind of memory now where I'm looking at it and I could, I could tell what it was going on, even if it was slightly out with the iPhone, no problem. But I got this back to the studio, put it all together and then just went to work. And it wasn't until I started painting it, you know, I got the colors down, but then I started to try this, this technique of, of getting the, the brushwork to, to read well. And my brush strokes were too clean. I wasn't getting this texture. It wasn't falling off the, uh, the, the paintbrush and wasn't creating this, uh, this surface quality that just felt alive in his painting. It was like texture was crossed over each other and little thin bits of paint was inside that texture. And then he would scumble across the top with some lighter color and it would even come alive more. And you got this multi-dimensional depth on the surface of the canvas. And here I was just single layer going, it's not quite looking right. And when I shifted up the type of application that I had and the type of brush, then suddenly it clicked into place. And, and so by doing a master copy, now suddenly that informed the next painting that I did that was my own work because I was, I was really just taken with these, these artists. So I thought, I'm going to work on top of some heavy texture and I'm going to use the same brushes that Arthur, that I used in the Arthur Wardle master copy. Now, I, I wasn't looking over Wardle's shoulder, so I don't know exactly what he was using but I can guess it was probably a pretty worn out bristle brush, something pretty chunky for some of these passages in the painting. And so I started to do the same with, with my own work and I, I, it unlocked a new level for me with, with how I apply paint. One thing that I'm just, just going on a bit of a tangent here, one thing that I'm really taken with now is extreme detail. Like I'm talking really pinpoint precise detail on small paintings so that when you look at that little painting, it almost looks photographic, but it opens up a little world that you could just go into. And, and so there's something about this juxtaposition between extreme detail and a small, tiny little painting, like an eight by 10, that draws your attention towards it. You know, it's hit and miss for me at the moment. You know, some of them I'm able to pull off. Some of them are a little bit more of a challenge, but that's something I'm really excited about at the moment, which is completely, it's almost diametrically opposed to, to what I was talking about. But there are some artists that I really enjoy when I look at their work. I'm inspired by them. Um, I haven't done any master copies yet, but artists like um, Louis Bouvelo from um, Australia, he, he predated, uh, he came before the, um, the Heidelberg School. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure, but he did a lot of beautiful Australian landscapes, you know, kind of colonial era Australian landscapes, but a lot of little stuff that was really striking that I got some, some pictures of. But yeah, back, back to the master copy. When it's, it's a copy, you state it's a copy, it's recognizable, it's obvious that it's a copy, good as gold. There are some rules out there though, if you want to turn around and sell that copy, that, that's where it can get a little bit tricky. I'm not going to sell mine, so I'm not going to run into any issue here. But from what I understand, most countries are pretty much aligned on this. There is some variations. So you'll have to do some research. But it's normally the artist's death plus 100 years. So if I wanted to do a painting by Waterhouse, I would need to work out, okay, when did he die? And I can't remember off the top of my head when Waterhouse died, but you'll be able to put it on the screen, I guess. But let's just say he died in 1908. Then his work is fair game from 2008 onwards, you know? And so that means I could copy it directly and sell it. And yes, it's, it's a tribute. It's, I think it's ethically, you, you have to, and legally you have to state that it's a true, or that it's a, it's a master copy of that work. But you can now, it's, it's what's in, it's called in the public domain. So you're able to, to, uh, to copy that and, and sell it and derive an income. It means that you can take that, for instance, and print it and put it on things like calendars and mouse pads and tea cozies and water bottles and all that kind of good stuff. But if, as an artist, you could do that and sell that as a, as a master copy. But one of the other rules, and I've seen this in some countries, is that you have to make your master copy at least 25% smaller than the original. It cannot be the same size as the original work. Um, so just, again, if a master copy is something you want to do and you want to sell them, then make sure you just check your copyright laws where you are. But if you're not going to sell them, they're just an exercise for you and you're going to hang it up in your studio. You're not going to part with it. Do whatever you want. It's a learning exercise. But if you're going to post it online, 
the internet's such a small place. Listen, man, in two seconds flat, they could do a Google reverse image search on, on, on your butt, you know, and they could just, they could show this thing and they'd be like, son of a gun copied so-and-so, you know, they, they can put it up. They can see exactly what you've done. So, um, that's, uh, it's dangerous now you're, you're, you're walking a dangerous line. If you, if you're copying other people's work and you're trying to make that out to be your own, uh, yeah, I could tell you all sorts of stories about people that have copied me and I got a chance to confront them. It's been a lot of fun. Um, some of them I'm not so proud of because I made them feel quite bad, but uh, never got legal, fortunately, uh, for because for, who's got time for that? But uh, I had a good giggle out of it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fascinating. That's really interesting. Well, we'll have to dip into that again in the future, because one thing I'd like to ask you about, and you did touch on it slightly, and it's a big feature of this channel that we really like to invest a bit of time into. So the next thing I'm going to ask you is about your color palette. If you can share every color you use and how you came to establish this palette, it'd be fascinating for us to learn about, please. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah. If I can remember every color, cause I use a bunch of different colors, but when I first started, I had like up to 35, even more colors that I had bought. Some I rarely touched, but a lot I used a lot of. And over time, that list of color has shrunk to an essential 10 to 12 colors that for most palettes that I'm using, it's those 10 to 12. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Eric Silver, uh, Blue Ridge Oil Paint. Now he, he is, um, I'm a bit of a brand ambassador for Eric Silver, but when I say that it took years for me to find a brand that I could really work with. Um, and it's all I use now. Uh, I have used a couple of supplemental colors here and there from like Williamsburg or some old stash that I have from, from paint that I bought years and years ago. Uh, but for the most part, for all my professional work, it's, it's, it's all blue Ridge oil paint. And so this is really, um, I, I think the first place to start is recognizing that not all oil paint is created the same. If you're buying a really, um, and, and this goes for watercolor, I'm sure it goes for acrylic too, but I, I don't really get into acrylic, but um, you know, th there you do get what you pay for. But with oil paint, what I like to go for is what's called a, a single source pigment. So that means when you pick up your tube of paint, you look at the back of the tube, or you're looking at the, the information on the manufacturing website as to what's in that tube of paint, you can see that it's got oil and one type of pigment in it. You know, some manufacturers will put a stabilizer in there. Normally it's an aluminum stearate. Um, Eric Silver does use a little bit of aluminum stearate. It's not completely stabilizer free, but that does improve the consistency. There's some people out there that are that are purists that um, really don't like stabilizer at all. I get it. I, I do respect that point of view. For me, I'm not quite that hardcore. I, I do think a little bit is okay. Haven't had any issues with it. And I still feel that my paintings are perfectly archival with just a little bit in there. But, you know, for the most part, yeah, they're all just one type of pigment with, with oil. And that's it. So when it's cobalt blue, it's real cobalt and linseed oil or safflower oil. Um, some oil manufacturers will, will have walnut oil in there, depending on what it is. Often whites will have an oil in there that's a non-yellowing oil, like, like a safflower, for instance, in, in your titanium, because over time, you know, the oil will have a tendency to yellow. Linseed oil is going to yellow a lot more than, than other colors, um, uh, than, than other oils. So, so that's the first place to start is finding paint that has got one source of pigment in there. And so this kind of cuts out, like if you were going to find like a, a color on the shelf that you, you were like, oh, wow, that's an interesting pinky purpley color. It's called, um, you know, romantic sunsets or I know it's corny, but let's say you, you picked up this, this type of pinky pastel mauve, you turn it over and there's five or six different pigments that went in to make that. Manufacturers will do that just so they could sell you more paint. But what I thought when I was buying paint, when I first started out, was like, if that's in the tube mixed up with that consistency to achieve that color, why don't I just get the different pigments that they use to achieve that? And then I just mix it myself. And I found that if I did that, if I applied that logic, I actually ended up with less tubes of paint that I had to buy. And I ended up buying the more high quality pigments, which yes, would be a little more expensive, but I ended up using less of them. So that, that was really important. So now what I have now is, is basically a, a system of color 
that's based on a pretty simple theory. So if you look at any domestic printer or any commercial printer for that matter, most printing processes will have what's called a CMYK system where they've got cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, K for black. So CMYK is what you'll find when you have to replace the ink cartridges on your printer at home. Now think about this. Printers at home have got such a limited palette. They've only got four colors that they're dealing with there. Yet, can you think of the range that a home printer, like a home laser printer can make now on high quality photo paper? The range is seemingly infinite when you look at that. Now, yes, I know that there's a dyeing process of, of where these different dots of color are actually you know, absorbed into that paper. And that's reflecting out some really high vibrant colors and it's slightly different with a subtractive method when you're adding one oil paint with the other, but you could still get pretty close. But as soon as I twigged on this idea, I started thinking, and, and I don't want to claim this is original, but I just kind of twigged on that idea for myself. I found that later that other artists had actually already stumbled into this and they were playing with this. Um, and shout out to Michael Wilcox, who does some fantastic work when it comes to color. He's got a great book called Blue and Yellow Don't Make Green. It's fascinating. I think every painter should have that in their library. But but I digress. Um, with, with color, uh, what, what I decided was, okay, I'm going to start off with that as the basis for my primary colors. So we learn in school that, that our primaries are red, yellow, and blue. But I was thinking, well, that kind of makes sense <clears throat> because from those primaries, I should be able to derive some really clean secondaries. I should be able to mix my red and blue together to get a great purple. I should be able to mix that blue and yellow together to make a great green. And that uh, you know, red and yellow will go together to make orange, right? What we find though, when we mix our primaries together is that the red and blue go together and now they're making brown. Uh, the blue and yellow go together. It makes a great, a great green that worked, but the orange, uh, the, the, the yellow and the red go together to make a desaturated drab orange. But when I mixed magenta with cyan with, with cadmium lemon, so I had quinacridone magenta, cobalt teal, permanent, uh, permanent blue 28 or permanent green 50. So PB28 or PG50, different manufacturers will use a slightly different variation, but that cobalt teal that Eric Silver makes, I just, oh, it's the best, most luminous teal color I've found. It's bang on the money when it comes to a cyan and it's so handy. So as I started to mix these together, I was like, hang on a second, this is, there's something going on here. So I mix that teal in with the magenta. I got this amazing range of blues, which just didn't compute for me. It was like, how is that? I've got this greeny blue and I've got this magenta and I'm getting this wide range, you know, almost through, you know, ultramarine almost uh, somewhere in that middle section. It's, it's incredible that range that I could get. Then when I mixed the teal with the cadmium lemon, I got this zinging high luminous. I, I wouldn't hardly be able to use it, but it's about the color of this pen, fluoro green, I, I got uh, mixing the cadmium lemon with cobalt teal. And then when you mix the cadmium lemon with the magenta, you go through this incredible range of scarlet, you know, and, and crimson. It's, it's bizarre. I was like, what, how does this work? And so I thought, I'm going to base my palette on that and then flesh it out from there. Now, I'm not making the claim that those three colors will mix everything you need because I need more than that. They all have a particular bias towards the cool side of things. So they're all cool colors in their own right. It turns out when you're trying to do this primary experiment, and if you study Michael Wilcox's work um, from, his, from his books and, and that one called Blue and Yellow Don't Make Green, he talks about the primary colors and how different primaries, when you split them up, one will have a bias. So your red will have a bias towards um, if I remember correctly, it'll have a slightly yellow bias in, in one case or in the other case, it might go shift, start shifting slightly, slightly blue in a way. So we'll start going to the, towards that side. So when it shifts slightly blue, you get more into the violets. When it shifts slightly yellow, you get more into the oranges. So there's a range even within red. But when, when we're trying to mix that primary experience uh, as an experiment, if we're mixing a cool red, with a warm blue, that's suddenly when we get this conflict because the biases are going in different directions and now you get a color that appears slightly off, brown, desaturated, drab, not luminous, not vibrant at all. And so that's when it can be quite disheartening. It's like, well, hang on a second, I got my red, blue, and yellow, but I'm not getting those secondaries. This could be why. 
But with that, those colors that I explained, they all have a bias towards that cool side of things. So you've got a very cool yellow, very cool uh, red color being magenta, and a very cool blue being the cobalt teal, almost green in a way. So from there, I decided, okay, well, I'm going to flesh this out. I'm going to treat that magenta as my red. I'm going to treat the cobalt teal as my blue and the cadmium lemon as my yellow. But I do need some earths in there as well. And so I'm, I'm a huge fan of burnt umber. I know there are some archival painters out there that really don't like it because of its hunger for oil, but I still stand by it. I love it. I use it for virtually all my work. I can't think of a painting that I've done recently that doesn't have burnt umber in it. Um, but that's something that helps drive the tonal or value range or hierarchy of values within my paintings. And then I'll use colors like um, yellow ochre. Um, more recently, what I've done with my ochres, I, I've dropped burnt sienna and yellow ochre. I will use them sometimes. They do have their uses, but I've, I've swapped them out for transparent red oxide and transparent yellow oxide. So what I can do is I can kind of explain these as I go through them, but I'm explaining them in order as well for how I lay this down on my palette. If you see any in any of my demos, a shot of my palette, you'll notice that that order always stays the same. I've got earths to the, uh, so facing my palette, I've got earths to the left of the white. The white is what is this kind of divider between earth and high, Q, high chroma colors. So, so everything to the left of the, left of the white is going to be my, my earth. Everything to the right is going to be those high chroma. So normally it goes uh, burnt umber, transparent red oxide, transparent yellow oxide. Then I've got my white. And then I start going through the rainbow, starting with my highest value closest to the white. So what would be my highest value color? So my lightest tone closest to that white, it's going to be that cadmium lemon. It's a very bright, tonally very, it's so closely related to that white in the, in the value register that I, I start off with yellow. And then it's almost like I uncoil that color wheel and go through yellow through that range of orange to red to violet to blue and I finish on green. And then if you took those colors and you had to connect them back up again, you'd see that color wheel once again. So it's really based on the color wheel as, as shown where you've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. So it's basically what we learned at school, Roy Gabiv, you know, the colors of the rainbow. So it's, it's basically that all over again. So with, with my, my high chroma colors, it then goes through cadmium lemon, but you notice when I when I said I, I couldn't just leave it with those three primary colors of cadmium, lemon, quinacridone, and cobalt teal. I had to, if I got a cool yellow there, I'm going to want a warm yellow and something that does something slightly different. And I'm playing constantly with transparency and opacity. So I've got a cool opaque yellow. That's the cadmium. I'm going to want a warm transparent yellow to counteract some of that effect. And so I've gone for Hansi yellow. More and more now I'm using Hansi yellow. I absolutely love it. It's a, it's a very warm, incredibly transparent color. And I've, I find that so useful for highlights, for glazing effects, for use in portraits and landscapes alike. It's been phenomenal. Then from there, I get into my cadmium red light, which is like fire truck red. It is a bright red, and it's, again, being cadmium, very opaque. But then I'll want something transparent. So I go for permanent crimson, which is a replacement to alizarin crimson. I don't use alizarin crimson. I recommend people don't use alizarin. But again, maybe this is me getting into that purist territory here. A lot of people are still using that alizarin, but it's what you call a fugitive color. It's not light fast at all. So in the presence of UV, it does have the tendency to fade. But maybe you don't have to worry that about that so much if you're not hanging it you know, in a spot where it's copying direct sunlight. Um, but from permanent crimson, I then have my conacridone magenta that bridges the gap between the reds and the blues. And then I go into ultramarine, cobalt blue, cobalt teal, and then finally, my only green that I, I, I will use a range of greens here and there. I have had some work that I've done where I'll use a few different tubes of green. But for the most part, those tubes of green don't get touched. It's just thalo green. If that, sometimes I can drop the thalo out. I rarely use it. I'm only using thalo green for the immediate foreground on a lot of landscape paintings. It never makes it into the background. So that's pretty much my palette in a nutshell. But, you know, with your colors, you're, you're, you're going to want to play with warm and cool, but also I, I do recommend having a range of transparent and opaque because once you start really playing with the capabilities of oil paint in particular, you'll notice the different effects that you can get from passages that are particularly opaque where you don't get this transfer of light coming through those underlying layers. You can use that to your advantage 
or transparent if you want to go into these delicate glazing techniques and effects that you can achieve by laying down thin films of transparent paint. That's, that's particularly cool, beautiful to use in landscapes to create more depth, atmosphere, maybe register your, your shadows at a lower key by getting some dark glazes in there, maybe rounding out the form in your portrait or separating objects in a still life. Glazing's where it's at, so you need that transparency there for glazing techniques. Oh, that was fantastically thorough. I really appreciate that. That's excellent. The one thing I would like to just clarify, I maybe missed this, but did you say you use both titanium and lead white? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so back to, you know, what, what I was talking about there with the opacity and transparency, you'll notice that when you're using titanium white, titanium is a fantastic paint because it's, it's one of the most reflective colors that, that we have. Um, it, 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 when we look at it through the microscope, those little titanium particles are almost like little spherules and they form a really opaque layer and they just really reflect that light so nothing reflects light as thick titanium white paint and that's the highest value in my hierarchy of values that i'll use in my paintings so when it comes to the sparkle of water uh, it, you know just little diamonds dancing across the surface of a lake or a stream that'll be pure titanium white um, you know, you could use it if you were painting, you know, the, the sun, for instance, and, and, and that, that had to be the exact brightest tone or any light source, you know. Um, but the criminance is, is white. It, it appears identical nearly, nearly, when you're looking at the two uh, whites sitting there side by side. Titanium and criminance, they, they reflect light in very much the same way, except when you start brushing into it and you start to see that criminus fall apart in front of your very eyes. I think this is why some people, when they start painting with it, they don't like it, is because it, it, it lacks that punch that titanium has. But titanium, when you're painting with it, has a tendency to overpower other colors that you're mixing it with. So if you've got some high key, high chroma colors, you wanna maintain that saturation of the chroma. Let's say you were going for a really intense red color. You wanna maintain that saturation of the red, but you wanna just gently lift the value. You go for that titanium white, suddenly you got pink. What happened there? I don't have that red. So you're constantly chasing your tail, fighting with yourself to achieve that saturation. When you're using something like lead white, you've got enough transparency there that you still have that register of that chromatic value that you're going for, that, that, that really intense color that you're going for. So I, I find criminance in particular, which is a stack lead white, um, is, is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Um, there's, and also there's a benefit to using lead. Lead white is one of the most archival colors that you can use. Lead-based anything is one of the most archival paint films that you can use. It's, it is structurally sound. It, it, when, it, when it takes up, you know, it, there's a process called polymerization when you're mixing oil paint with, with linseed oil. So that's contained in some mediums and things that we use, or you could be using direct uh, linseed oil. Um, just a little bit though, we could talk about ratios and stuff. There's a ratio that I, that I like to stick to. But as it's forming the structure, it's just the way the lead, and I'm no chemist, and, and I, I might have my science wrong here, but from what I understand from, from uh, looking into the work of uh, people like Virgil Elliott, for instance, um, who's got a wonderful Facebook page called Traditional Oil Painting, but he's also got a, a fantastic book um, of the same title called Traditional Oil Painting. Um, and so I, I'm flicking through that book constantly. It really breaks down. The guy knows the craft of painting. He's, he's great with that stuff. So... Um, you know, he talks about lead white and it just being one of the most structurally sound paint films that you can you can use. And so most layers of my painting will have a little bit of lead white in there. There is just the added benefit if it's just not overpowering or overbearing like titanium white in terms of, you know, your values and, and kicking other colors around, creating this chalky type character. Lead white doesn't really seem to do that. You can maintain that chromatic range without without blowing it with with creating this chalk that you you do get with the titanium so so i i, I love it and so those two two colors really work fantastic but one of the things that i love to do as well in those initial layers of paint is i'll actually mix them together and the reason i'll mix them together to make some sort of mixing white is i've got the benefit of the opacity of the titanium but knocked the edge off that harshness 
of that opacity. And I've got the beauty of that structural integrity of the criminals. Now they're working in tandem and it's a great way to build up that painting by using that as just a mixing wipe. Some manufacturers will mix them together. I like having them separate on the palette, but for my block-ins, normally I take those two at 50-50, mix them together, boom, I'm off. That's incredible. That's, it gives you a level of control, I suppose, that you wouldn't have where you'd have them pre-mixed. So yeah, very Absolutely. nice, very interesting insight there. I really appreciate that. Now, to shift gears slightly though, I did want to ask you, um about any exhibitions you have coming up that you'd like people to either know about or to see as this will be airing on the 13th of december i believe mm -hmm. yeah so i i i haven't exhibited my work in many many years um i i and i would like to i i'd like to do that again i i I suppose it's a bit of a good problem. Um, I'm not able to accumulate work long enough to actually put together an exhibition. Um, and most of the work that I've done in recent years is, is a lot of that work I've also kept and it's in my personal collection and I, I don't want to part with it. Um, things like master copies, things like portraits. I, I did a portrait of my wife. I'm not, never parting with that. Um, and so I... I and there's a few demos that I'll do that are maybe slightly obscure that maybe don't lend themselves to a sale, but um, we're great for a demonstration or a lesson and I'll hang up a studio decoration, for instance. That's kind of been my work over the last five or six years and putting together an exhibition has been incredibly difficult, but I also work on a lot of commission work. So I'll, I'll get commissions and I'll be working on these special requests. And because my collectors are all over the world, it's really difficult. It's almost impossible to get it together in one building for one time. The insurance would be a nightmare. The logistics alone, you know, somebody's painting got damaged or lost in transit. It's just, it's just not something, a, a risk I'd be willing to take. And I certainly don't want to put them at risk either, uh, my clients. So I, I don't have any exhibitions coming up. I do have dreams of putting one together in the, in, hopefully in, in the next few years. I, I would love to do an exhibition here in New Zealand. I've never exhibited here in New Zealand, um, except for a brief stint when I had my own gallery in the South Island in, in a little town called Lawrence. Um, and people remember that because I did some YouTube videos from that location. And I announced on my social media at the time that I was opening up my own space. That was only open for one season. And then... Uh, COVID hit and it, and it shut down the world. And uh, I, I didn't open again after that. I just uh, ran it as a film studio uh, when, when things went back to what appeared to be normal, uh, the new normal, we won't get onto that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, so now I, I'm, I'm trying and I'm thinking about putting together a body of work. But as I'm putting together this body of work, I, I even if it's not commissioned, I'll put it on social media and say, Hey, I just finished this painting. Oh, it's available. It, it, it's up selling uh, within the day. So it's uh, it's difficult to to put it together. Um, but hopefully one day soon, I do have this vision that I'd, I'd love to do some big, epic New Zealand paintings uh, and get that together in one room and then maybe sell it. Uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. But um, for me now, my, my priority really is the teaching. I, I love to teach. I love people. I love, um, as cheesy as this sounds, uh, I, I think we talked about this in our first conversation, which is uh, giving the gift of art. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we spoke about that, but when, when, you, when you teach somebody else how to paint, you are, you're helping them unlock something for themselves. It's a gift that really is, it's, it's like handing somebody, it's almost like handing, oh, it's probably a terrible analogy, but it's like handing somebody a hammer and giving them a bit of building knowledge and they're like, okay, go build something with that, you know, and, and, and it, it, that's kind of what I feel like as a, as a teacher. But to me, that is so fulfilling doing that is, is passing on that knowledge, giving people the techniques. Um, I suppose I'm going to have to give away some paintbrushes now, uh, now that I've used that analogy, but <clears throat> giving people the, uh, the techniques and, and the, you know, th that information and, really sharing concepts with people that they might not have come across before, maybe presented or explained in a way that they haven't heard that before. And maybe that will help them unlock something. We're getting good reports back from people who are, who've joined us on the, uh, the online Academy. 
We've got well over a thousand members now, which is fantastic. Um, we've gone independent. I was on Patreon, still on Patreon, but I've, I've transitioned out of that to our new independent website. And that's something I'm so passionate about. I really am passionate about that because it gives me a chance to not only share demonstrations and videos with people, but interact with them in a really real way in the community, whether it's via live stream or I'm able to like see their work and comment it, uh, on it and, uh, and you know, share with them some, some critiques and, and insights and various things, but really just celebrate what they're doing. <clears throat> and that, that's been fantastic. So whenever, you know, I, I found whenever the teaching side of things has gotten quite involved for me, the original paintings, whilst I'm producing original work, it's more geared towards that. And it's not so much um, conducive to, to exhibiting, I found. But who knows, you know, one day here in the next few years, I, hopefully I'll be able to put together a body of work. We'll, we'll see. Well, it's, it's like you said, it's a great problem to have. And I'm, you know, very happy for you that you have that name and success because it's definitely so well earned and the product shows for itself how much impact it has on people who purchase and admire your work. And I'm one of the people who definitely admires it and we'd love to see it in person at some point in the future. But the last thing that I would uh, like to ask you is um, where we should encourage people to go and either purchase or support you or see your work and any kind of you know your podcast your website your instagram what is it you'd like people to see well i i i, I do oh thank you so much i i do i do all kinds um so I, the, the probably the best place to start is is on my website but most people watching this will might have seen me on YouTube and, and that seems to be with the online thing, the, the first place that people start to become aware of me and, and start following me from there. So I'm on YouTube. If you just search Andrew Tischler Artist, you'll pull up my channel. Um, I'm putting out free videos pretty regularly now. We, we've just about got it sorted where we can go back to weekly videos, which I'm super excited about. It's, it's going to take a bit of work to maintain that consistency, but I'm really excited about the next uh, round of videos that I've got coming out there. Um, my website is just andrewtischler.com. It will redirect to the new website, which is tischler.nz. That's tischler.nz. Check the spelling of my last name. It's T-I-S-C-H-L-E-R. And so, yeah, my website will link to basically everything, but it's uh, it's it's really, yeah, I, I think YouTube, I mean, everything's connected now. I've got a podcast. So, I mean, if you just search me anywhere, I'm going to come up. So if you search me on iTunes, I'll come up. I've got a show called The Creative Endeavor with Andrew Tischler. Um, and that goes for Spotify and Podbean as well. Those, those, uh, and Stitcher, those, um, shows are up on there. Uh, what else do I have going on? Instagram, Facebook. I got all that. I'm not on X yet. I don't know if I will join it. I don't know if I have time in my life for, for another thing. Uh, so I've, I've resisted getting into TikTok or threads or anything like that. I've got Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, a podcast, a website, and an online academy. That's my dance cards punched, man. Uh, it's pretty full. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, all so, the links will be in the description of this video. And I uh, very much encourage everyone to go and seek you out. So everything awesome. will be itemized below uh, in the description of this video. So go and check that out. But I, I do want to say, I, I do want to just add one thing, because you, you, you mentioned something about purchasing my work. I, I don't want to feel that I'm not... You know, I'm not I'm not selling. If people want to buy it, that's awesome. But it's it's if if yeah, I don't, I don't want to come across it too cheesy with with the sales pitch kind of thing. But um, you know, it's wonderful when somebody buys a painting, and and I'm sure you know people watching this, listening to this right now. If you make a sale, um, it's one of the greatest compliments anybody could pay you. That uh, they're they're saying, listen, I I love this thing you created so much. I want to part with my hard earned money that I traded time to accumulate to live with that work, you know, it, and it's this, the, one of the most validating things for an artist is to have somebody purchase their work. But for me, what's also really important and, and really validating for me is people that take the time to, when they're just watching a video, click the like button and leave a comment and tell them what it meant to them. That, that, that's amazing. I, I, I get, you know, wonderful comments and messages and all sorts. Now I got a lovely comment today. You know, I just said to somebody, yeah, you know, the painting's available if you want it. Somebody bought, ended up buying, I had a couple of people vying for this particular painting. 
but but somebody ended up buying it and uh, somebody also messaged and said, listen, I absolutely love this painting. I'd love to buy it. I can't afford it, but I just wanted to tell you that I just love it so much. And that meant so much to me. So th that's awesome. You know, just giving an artist, you know, a, a compliment. So if you're if you're watching this or listening to this now, you know, don't just sit there and scroll. If you see something cool and awesome, it doesn't have to be on my social media. You know, this could be for anything. Take a minute, just leave a comment. Just say, hey, this is awesome. This really inspired me today. Keep keep on going. You know, even if it's somebody that you think could use a word of encouragement, that you'll never know how that can impact somebody. If I'm feeling particularly off or I'm having a bad day, it happens, you know. Uh, I, I will I will sometimes jump into that comment section. And it'll, it'll give me a boost. It'll, it'll really give me a boost. But um, I, I got to say again, the thing that I absolutely love is, is Tish Academy. This has been a passion project of mine for three years now. It's finally grown into this thing that is now called Tish Academy. And this is where I'm sharing, in my opinion, some of the best teaching videos I've ever produced. And it's all in one place, categorized in a library. There's well over 100 hours. In fact, I, 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 I'm sure, I can't say for certain, but I'm sure it's over 200 hours of video content. No one has that kind of time to watch that, but you can get into the library there. You can watch things on different different topics, whether it's portraiture, seascapes, landscapes, there's critique videos, there's live streams from my academy tier students every week. Um, it's just an awesome place. There's a place where you can even video chat with other members and message them directly. It's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So that's been a real project of mine. So anybody listening to this, and this is just something that I, that I offer to whoever wants to sign up. There's an immediately a seven day free trial uh, if you want to try it. And there's also a 30 day money back guarantee. And there's two tiers. And so if you're wondering what's involved, you know, the first tier, just a base level tier, gives you access to all kinds of stuff. And it's only five bucks a month. The higher tier is 18 bucks a month, but that's for the people that are really serious about their art and they really want to push things further and really see themselves level up and grow artistically. So check that out. Again, comes with those guarantees. Try it for a week. If you don't love it, no hard feelings, all good. You know, but uh, I, I'm sure that when you get in there and you see what's going on, you're going to love it. That's amazing. That's amazing. No, I absolutely do encourage everyone watching and listening to go and check out the links, try out the uh, um, the courses, because I do see the comments on your Instagram about people who are incredibly satisfied with what they've experienced and witnessed and uh, learned from you. So, but yeah, I just want to thank you for how generous you've been with your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and uh, I really appreciate it. Oh, it's it's been an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.